be given the focus of your event on Afghanistan. Since August, the Asian Society has been deeply seized with the events in Afghanistan, not just at a policy level, but at a practical level too, with the 60 members of our Afghan 21 community, which forms part of our broader Asia Society 21 Young Leaders family. Many of these Afghan 21 fellows have served in key positions uh, in the Afghan government, including cabinet ministers, as well as across the media, civil society and international organizations. They've also been prominent in promoting the rights of women. They've been leading voices for reform, accountability and good governance, as well as for an inclusive, representative and tolerant society. That is why the Asia 21 network have been eager to have no stone unturned in recent months in their efforts to help these young leaders who have done so much for their country. And I'm proud of what we've done as an institution, that's Asia Society, uh, to support them in these efforts. Now that the immediate evacuation effort by many countries has concluded, it's important that we do not allow ourselves simply to lose sight of what is happening in Afghanistan in the, in the period ahead. I therefore want to particularly thank JP Morgan Asia for their partnership with today's event and for their support more generally for the Asia Society. This includes uh, the support of our trustee, Nicholas Agazen, over a long period of time, many, many years. Thank you, Gucho. First as CEO of JP Morgan International's private bank based in Hong Kong, and now as CEO, of course, of the Hong Kong Exchange. I also want to pay tribute to our Hong Kong Centre especially its chair, Ronnie Chan, and its director, Alice Mong, as they prepare to celebrate their 10th anniversary of the building, which opened in February 2012. All of us uh, at the Asia Society, myself included, are very much looking forward to being with you in person in Hong Kong before too much longer. Thank you again for convening this important discussion today, and I look forward to what more we're able to do as an organisation to help shine a light on Afghanistan and the massive challenges which now lie ahead for that country. I have a deep attachment to Afghanistan personally, having visited the country many, many times as a prime minister, as a foreign minister, as a member of the Australian parliament. The good people of Afghanistan deserve much better than they currently have received from the international community and from the domestic political circumstances now prevailing in their country. Let's work together to improve their lot. I thank you. I'm Ronnie Chan, I'm the chairman of, can you hear me? No. Hello, can you hear me now? No, can you hear me? No, shall I just speak louder? Okay, uh, I hope the mic, there we go. Uh, I trust that uh, Kevin is still around. Uh, Kevin, thank you for joining us for opening remarks. Uh, you, you all know Kevin as the Prime Minister of uh, Australia formerly and Foreign Minister. But Asia Society was very, very, very honored that um, we were able to um, ask Kevin to join us first as the president of the SP, which is the Asia Society Policy Institute, and later as the president of the entire Asia Society. Uh, as, the, as the then chair of the Asia Society, I'd like to take a, a lot of credit for that, but although it is not due. Uh, anyway, I should also mention, uh, Kevin, that uh, now um, Filippo Gori from the JP Morgan, uh, the CEO uh, and chairman of Asia Pacific, is also on the board of the Asia Society. I think he's one of the newest member of the global board, of which I'm now only emeritus. Uh, I know a lot, some of those uh, fellows, uh, Asia 21 fellows uh, from Af Afghanistan, uh, but in Hong Kong, we have seldom do programs on Afghanistan. And I'm so glad that JP Morgan has given us this uh, impetus, this opportunity. We thank you. Uh, this is wonderful to work together. By the way, this is the second program in less than a week that uh, JP Morgan and Asia Society have collaborated together. Uh, Afghanistan is not, frankly, not a country that many Hong Kong people know or understand much. Uh, that said, uh, it's our fault, not theirs. Uh, I say that there are two countries I know that never, um, almost never lose a war historically. One is Vietnam, 1956 to defeat it, 
the French in Dien Bien Phu in 1975. They chase America. I'm American, sadly, uh, in this regard, uh, out of the country. And then in 1979, uh, they gave China a hell of a hard time uh, when the two had some confrontation. The other is Afghanistan. Uh, goes all the way back to uh, almost the, uh, Elliot, am I correct, in the great games, the British and the Russians were all over there from 1830 some, all the way to the beginning part of the 20th century. And very, very few countries have been able to tame that really amazing country. Uh, the Russians had a hard time there, uh, and the British even in recent days, and then of course Russia, and then now America. I, although I obviously think that it's a little unfair to say that uh, Biden is to, should take all the blame for what's happening there. There are two ways usually America get out of a war. Uh, the first one is I win, uh, and such as Second World War, such as um, Cold War, such as um, Desert Storm. And America is a pretty good winner. It's not a bad winner at all. Uh, not a bad loser at all. Well, loser, anyway. Uh, the second way America get out of war is really what I call the Korean War model. And that is when it realizes that it cannot win, it just quietly de departs. That was Korea, that was Vietnam, and that's now Afghanistan. Then of course, you have China, uh, which abuts Afghanistan. A lot of people don't know that, but the truth is that I think something like 92 kilometer, very narrow, but it's, it's significant to be abutting each other. And I see um, China playing an increasing role uh, for once, uh, for one, on the eastern end, it can be a bypass to the China-Pakistan uh, corridor, which is so, which is existentially significant for China. And then on the west, bordering on Iran, can be also a supply of oil and gas uh, from Iran all the way straight into China in Xinjiang. So Afghanistan is truly an amazing country. I'm so glad that JP Morgan has suggested this uh, program and Azad is very, very happy uh, to work with JP Morgan. Uh, with that, I will now invite uh, the CEO of uh, JP Morgan Hong Kong, uh, Ms. Hashka Patel to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much, Ronnie. And it's so good to see so many wonderful faces um, in the audience today. When we first started plotting today's, um, today's proceedings, we thought it would be a Zoom only event and that nobody would want to be here in person. So it's great to see almost a hundred people here in person tonight with over a couple of hundred people also dialed in to the, to the Zoom. So once again, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Asia Society for your beautiful um, location tonight. Um, but now to introduce our moderators. Um, Oscar Wilde once said, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Being forgotten is the one theme, the one phrase, which I've heard repeatedly as I've watched footage after footage of families left in Afghanistan to face the humanitarian crisis which is unfolding there in their country. Banks running out of money, unpaid wages, soaring food prices. All of these factors are already taking a heavy toll on the families there, with the United Nations predicting that over 95% of Afghans will be under the poverty line by the middle of next year, unless the world is able to provide crucial financial and humanitarian aid. However, we are here today as our two moderators, Anna Corrin, and Elliot Hillman have not forgotten. I met Elliot in the spring of 2018. He was going to join my team here in Hong Kong, straight out of the army, knowing nothing about banking, ready to start a new chapter in his life. He was very proud of the Afghanistan that he had left after two long stints there. However, as the news unfolded back in the summer, I distinctly remember his words. All I want to do is get on a plane and fly there, try to stop what's happening and help. For the past few months, Elliot has been working tirelessly with his former army colleagues to help evacuate families out of Afghanistan. And he's also spearheading the establishment of a charity called Support Our Afghans, while using sessions like today to continue to raise awareness. Anna, 
as many of you already know, has dedicated much of her 20 year career in journalism to Afghanistan, bringing a powerful awareness of the unfolding situation to global audiences. In wake of the events of the last few months, Anna has dedicated much of her time to leveraging her on the ground network to help vulnerable families. And in her most recent story, she casts a light on the heartbreaking stories of very young girls who are being married off so that their families can make ends meet. So with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Anna, who's gonna talk a bit more about her recent work. And then of course, Anna and Elliot will um, be start of the show interviewing um, our two friends on the screen. Thanks, Anna. Thank Thanks, you. Elliot. Thank you so much for your very kind words. Yes, my name is Anna Corrin. I am an international correspondent um, working at CNN. I have had a bit of a love affair with Afghanistan for the past decade. Um, I, I went there in 2012 and I fell in love with the, the story, the country, the people. There's just something about it that gets under your skin. Uh, I was last there in July and uh, it, I was there to cover the, the US withdrawal um, from, from Bagram Air Base. However, what sort of transpired, you know, in, in the coming weeks, I don't think anyone saw coming. Um, joining us, obviously, is Elliot Hillman, who uh, I have, have got to meet through these last few months because of the the evacuation of, of, of people that we care about. Uh, and then joining us tonight, uh, I don't know whether they're gonna pop up on the screen shortly, is one of the most inspiring women you will ever meet. Her name is Mabuba Siraj. Uh, she is a women's rights activist and she, <laughs> she has a US passport. She has a US passport. She could have left the country, but she chose to stay in Kabul and look after the women and girls who are in her care. And she is still there today and she'll be talking to us. Also joining us is Dawood, who is a, a former Afghan uh, special forces soldier who Elliot knows very well and who I happened to, to meet uh, and work with in, in July. He was providing security for the safe house that I was staying in in Kabul. So we are going to be speaking to Mabuba and, uh, and uh, Wood. But before they come up on the screen, I, I just want to perhaps you know, set the scene. Um, it was touched on beforehand as, as to the economic and humanitarian crisis that is unfolding. And we can talk about it and we know people are hungry and we know winter is coming. But, but when you find out that there are families that are selling their young daughters so they can feed the rest of the country, or feed the rest of their family, I should say, I think it really hits home. As, as to the level of desperation in the country right now. So can we please play that story that went to air on CNN? Right, with our world lead now in a distressing story out of Afghanistan, showing the harsh reality of the humanitarian crisis engulfing the country, especially post-Taliban rule, desperate families so impoverished, they tell CNN they have no choice but to sell their young daughters into some twisted form of marriage. In this exclusive report, CNN witnesses the tragic fate facing these helpless little girls in this culture where girls and women are too often treated horrifically. The parents gave us full access and permission to talk to the children and show their faces because they say they cannot change the practice themselves. CNN's Anna Corrin reports. In this arid, desolate landscape, not a scrap of vegetation in sight lies a makeshift camp for some of Afghanistan's internally displaced. <laughs> Among its residents, nine-year-old Pawana. Her bright pink dress squeals of laughter and childhood games, a ruse to the horrors unfolding in this unhospitable environment. <laughs> Pawana's family moved to this camp in Baghdad's province four years ago after her father lost his job. Humanitarian aid and menial work earning $3 a day, providing the basic staples to survive. But since the Taliban takeover two and a half months ago, any money or assistance has dried up. And with eight mouths to feed, Pawana's father is now doing the unthinkable. I have no work, no money, no food. I have to sell my daughter, he says. I have no other choice. 
Bawana, who dreams of going to school and becoming a teacher, applies makeup. A favorite pastime for little girls, but Pawana knows she is preparing for what awaits her. My father has sold me because we don't have bread, rice and flour. He has sold me to an old man. The white bearded man who claims he's 55 years old comes to collect her. He's bought Pawana for 200,000 Afghanis, just over 2,000 US dollars. Covered up, Pawana whimpers as her mother holds her. This is your bride. Please take care of her, says Pawana's father. Of course I will take care of her, replies the man. His large hands grab her small frame. Pawana tries to pull away. As he carries her only bag of belongings, she again resists, digging her heels into the dirt. But it's futile. The fate of this small, helpless child has been sealed. Child marriage is nothing new in poor rural parts of Afghanistan. But human rights activists are reporting an increase in cases because of the economic and humanitarian crisis engulfing the country. <laughs> These are devastating decisions that no parent should ever have to make. And it really speaks to what an extraordinary breakdown is happening in Afghanistan right now. For months, the UN has been warning of a catastrophe as Afghanistan, a war ravaged aid dependent country, descends into a brutal winter. Billions of dollars in central bank assets were frozen after the Taliban swept to power in August. Banks are running out of money. Wages haven't been paid for months while food prices soar. According to the UN, more than half the population doesn't know where their next meal is coming from. And more than 3 million children under the age of five face acute malnutrition in the coming months. The people of Afghanistan need a lifeline. And while a billion dollars has been pledged by UN donors to help the Afghan people, less than half those funds have been received as the international community holds off recognizing the Taliban government. People of Afghanistan will be dying of hunger in the next couple of months, and not just a few. This is just making people more and more vulnerable, and we, we cannot accept that. Sentiments shared by the Taliban. We are asking aid agencies to come back to Afghanistan and help these poor people, otherwise the crisis will worsen. For this family in neighboring Gore province, they are trying to sell two daughters, nine-year-old Litan and four-year-old Zeton for a thousand US dollars each. Do you know why they're selling you? The journalist asked Zeton. Because we are a poor family and don't have any food to eat, she says. Are you scared? He asks. Yes, I am. Another family in Gore province borrowed money from their 70-year-old neighbor. Now he's demanding it back, but they have nothing to give except their 10-year-old daughter, Magu. My daughter doesn't want to go and is crying all the time. I am so ashamed, he says. Terrified, she threatens to take her life. If they push me to marry the old man, I will kill myself. I don't want to leave my parents. Days later, she discovers the sale has been finalised. Another Afghan child sold into a life of misery. So that last girl, Magul, she is supposed to be handed over to uh, that man, the 70-year-old man, by the end of the week. We are currently working uh, tirelessly with, with, with aid groups on the ground to, to make sure that does not happen. Joining me is the beautiful Mabuba Siraj. So lovely to see you, a force to be reckoned with, as well as Dawood. Wonderful to see you too. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a room uh, filled with people who are so keen to hear your stories. Uh, Mabuba, let's start with you. That piece that we just showed of the girls being sold, these are the types of girls that end up in your care. Tell everybody about the incredible work that, that you've been doing and are doing now 
in Afghanistan. Thank you for having me on this amazing uh, platform at the Asia Society, and it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you very much. Um, seeing, taking a look at the faces of these little girls and especially the pain on the last one in her face because she's a bit older, so she knows what is really, what she should expect out of this whole thing. Uh, it's absolutely breaking my heart because that is something that I deal with or I have been, I have been dealing with uh, with the girls that are coming to my shelter, actually. Uh, this shelter was created in 2003 in Kabul as the first one actually that started, it was mainly for the abused women of Afghanistan and abused from these kind of situations. I mean, right now, the situation is really because of the hunger that has happened and the girls are being sold. But this kind of marriages, these kind of forced marriages, they are, uh, how can I say, a thing of, of, of uh, of everyday life in this country. It happens, especially in the faraway, in the provinces, you know, like uh, Baudris, you saw it, you know, you saw how barren that land was and you saw how, how, what kind of a life the people have over there. Usually in that kind of a provinces of Afghanistan, these things do happen a lot. And, um, and then of course they get hurt, they get uh, abused, they get mistreated and God knows what else. And then they end up at the door of, of any one of these you know, shelters or safe houses for them. And one of them is mine. Right now, the whole system is in, in Afghanistan is actually falling apart. There's no more a Ministry of Women's Affairs that was looking after them or accepting them or, or, or other, you know, the Human Rights Commission that was doing the work or none of these. So, uh, so now these girls, they are just, they just, they just are there. So I do receive calls, like for example, sometimes from the uh, from the police station, which is in my neighborhood, and they are calling me to come and pick up a lady that they have found on the street. Usually, some of these girls, when they come and they run away from home, especially nowadays, uh, they are mentally disturbed as well. So, so I sent my the driver of the office with a with the lady that is in charge of with the girls that they are staying in the shelter in the middle of the night, and then they go and pick them up and bring them back into the shelter. So then, then we look after them. The first thing we, we the, the girls get together around them, they give them a cup of tea and then something warm to drink. And then they will, they usually arrange a, you know, warm up the bathroom for them to go and take a, take a shower or take a bath and, and wear some clean clothes. And, and just, you know, that's the way they want to, they want to, <coughs> excuse me, that's the way they want to welcome them. So then, uh, then they come and they stay and, and we are the ones that I'm, I mean, I'm the one right now, that actually my shelter is the only one that is really open, um, that I'm, I'm looking after these girls. And then, Bebe, you, you, you have a US passport. You lived in America for more than 20 years. Yes, you could have left the country back in August. You chose to stay to look after these women and girls. Absolutely. I thought I thought somebody because I knew the way the way the whole thing started with the Taliban coming and with the kind of a, um, um, how shall I say the memories that the people of Afghanistan have from the last time the Taliban were here. Um, nobody was going to stick around that that I knew that was going to be very hard for them and they're going to be leaving the first chance they get. And then and then there are some people in Afghanistan that they cannot leave. So, you know, after the 35 million population of this country, you know, not everybody can leave. So there's going to be women that they're going to be around and especially the girls at my shelter. Although some of them we have managed to, 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 to um, arrange to, to, to be going out, but the rest of them can't. So they're all there. And, 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 and I decided to stick around and to be here, to be their voice and to look after them and not to let any harm uh, come to them. So that's that's what I'm doing. And just, just talking about the women of Afghanistan, being their voice, uh, looking after things, um, you know, it's just, just something that uh, when the first time when I came to Afghanistan in 2003, I decided to do, I'm still doing that. So, um, so that's why I, I, I decided to stay in Afghanistan.
so so incredibly brave, so so courageous. You you truly are an inspiration. Dawood, you and I worked together in July of, of all things. You were were my security in, in the safe house that we stayed and, and you were one of the the you know lucky ones to to get out. And I know that Elliot wants to talk to you about that. But why did you want to become a, a an, an Afghan special forces soldier? What was it that that made you want to serve your country? Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you very much to have me in here. So um, uh, I was uh, dreaming to be a, uh, a military man, be a part of the uh, people who serving, who take care of the people of my country. Um, I, was the, uh, I wanted to, um, um, to serve my country. That's why I choose the, this way to go and join the military, join the army, and start serving the country. On the first, uh, and Dawood, when you when you were serving in the Afghan military, you spent most of your time in in southern Afghanistan, and I think um, uh, you know many of the audience, uh, if you don't know Afghanistan, in fact, the pictures that you saw in the video earlier are a very yeah. arid landscape, um, very difficult place to live. Southern Afghanistan is is very similar to that. Um, uh, Dawood, when when you were when you were spending a lot of your time uh, as a soldier, did you did you have hope? For the country, for the future of Afghanistan, did that did that drive you forward? Is was that something that united you and your colleagues in in what you were doing? Yeah, actually, uh, when we were in the military, uh, we, we were hope so that, that our country will not going back back behind. So we will, we will, we will hope we were hope that uh, we will going mm-hmm. forward. So um, the, um, the, this this all of the things that becomes together and give us the power and give us the morale to be and be, be a staying apart and try to serve our country and to to, to be a part of the, the the security forces for to keep secure uh, to serve our country so as i said we never thought this that we might be one day going back so uh, we, we have been used all of the, our energy all of the all of the time most of the, our time to to be a stay or the, a stay in the in, in 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 the military and to serve our country. And, and tell me, or, or tell us, and, and those dialed in online as well. Um, you know, a lot of that changed, obviously, uh, after you after you left the military, and and particularly over the last six months. So, um, and as Anna alluded to, you're obviously now in the UK. Um, uh, for the benefit of the audience. Dawood um, uh, left Afghanistan in, in August and, and with the help of some friends of his uh, and some ex-colleagues was able to make it back to the UK. But Dawood, why don't you, you give us a, a bit of a picture and tell the story about how that transpired over the last six months and, um, uh, and, and how you managed to, to get out of Afghanistan. So, um, actually, on the, um, even from the last day that um, Kabul been fallen, we we never we couldn't even believe it that this gonna happen, but it is happened. Everything is happened quickly. So uh, the, the day that um, um, uh, the, the day that Kabul been fallen, so I was in the office. So which is when I was came around, came out, it was the it was a very completely different situation. Everyone were around, were running around, and it was a high traffic. And I was with a couple of the um, uh, military vehicles was just parked in the middle of the road and there wasn't weren't anyone inside. So in that time, um, I tried to reach the home as soon as it possible because uh, the, my, my family were worried and they were keep calling me. That's what's going on. Um, so no one's have been said anything on the news, on the uh, on the anything. But uh, so I reached the homes. It's it, it was I was it was like a two hours, three hours to walking and running to, uh, I reached the home. So when I was there, uh, so uh, I was cl- leaving the clothes by the, the military, uh, Afghan military camp. So uh, when I was on the home, I was showing that all of the, those military people have been taken off the uniforms and wearing the, the civilian civilian clothes and they everyone just trying to leave and run away. So I reached the home uh, and um, uh, the, the the first day, uh, I was sat at home and 
the, the the night when they when they come and look they they come into the to uh, after the some of the people on the they were on the um, my neighborhood they were come uh, they 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 were come looking for me as well to the our apartment David, uh, uh, when you're saying they who are you talking about the people that the, 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 I mean the the Taliban the the Taliban they come in to to look after some of the people when they 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 have been working for the for the Afghan previous government and uh, and and also the people who have been working for long term for foreigners like me. So uh, the Taliban the night the night the first night when the Taliban came I I jump off and escape away from home. So uh, after one hour when I was away, so I was trying to call the family to asking the situation. They, they the, the, the my family they couldn't even talk on the phone. They were just told me, don't come back home tonight. So I, I was uh, another the second day I was out out of the home. The third night when I come. Uh, third evening so uh, again the taliban they come again to the uh, to break into the, my apartment and i was escaped again so at this time the first time they they, they didn't mention any names any anyone they had, haven't haven't anything but the second times they had the pictures they had the names they had the, the taliban had the phone numbers addresses and everything and uh, they they warned the, our uh, the, my uh, owner of the apartment say um, they showed the picture showed my pictures and the, uh, all of the mighty details and they said you have the responsible if this guy come in here you have to let us know and they give them the some, the, some tele- telephone number to be in contact with them so in that time um, uh, in that time when I was away, I was directly in contact with the with the, my friend. I've been the contact. Uh, I've been contact with them in the, in the military in the British Army. And I told them exactly the the situation. They were in that time. They were in the Camp Baron to for ev- these evacuations. So in the night, they they give me the directions and they give me the uh, the the complete information that how to get in inside the Camp Baron and the the, the next day. I took myself and my family inside the camp barren. I was over there for like five or six days, and then the and then they flew out to the out of Afghanistan with the uh, with the others. That so was they, it. So they they came looking for you. Um, a quick escape. You went back to get your family, and and, and fortunately now you managed to to make your way to the airport and uh, and get back to the UK. And I think we'll come back. I, I want to try and get get people to understand that the 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 uh, the challenge for you and your family and and all of the other afghans that have managed to escape kabul is not yet over i think it would be nice to come back to that but perhaps in the meantime we go we go back to mabu because of course for you the taliban are still ever present in kabul so could you give us a bit of an idea a bit of a picture as, as to what it's like now for you and and the girls in the home so um, um, uh... For me, Sorry, to, to Mabuba. Me? Yeah, to Mabuba, please. Thank you. Um, the um, the way the things are kind of on the on the streets. Um, they are uh, they are calming a little bit. I can I can say that. Um, they are, but you know, the Taliban are around. They are doing their thing, and the people are on the streets. I do see more women actually, which is a a, a much better sign right now. You know, and and I'm hoping to be able to see more women because the women that they are when they are walking around and they are going back and forth on the street, that means that it's kind of an some kind of a normalcy. Although, uh, of course, none of them can go to work. Uh, none of them have been able to. Uh, the girls going to school uh, recently, Herat apparently opened for the high school girls to go back to school, but Kabul it hasn't. Kabul is still closed for the girls. And um, so, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, this is where we are. Um, I'm getting more and more uh, calls, uh, not, not as much lately for, for leaving Afghanistan, believe it or not, it's not that because apparently they know number one, because I cannot do that. And number two is the more call, the calls that I'm getting now are mainly about people that don't have jobs and they really don't know how to, how to feed their families, what to do about the winter that is coming. They haven't bought the, 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 um, uh, you know, the wood or whatever it is for, for burning and for, for the heat. 
And uh, so that's what I'm getting. I'm getting most more of those calls. Uh, people actually asking for some kind of a monetary help, if we could help them to, uh, you know, to 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 kind of uh, go on about their lives. Uh, there are there are people in Kabul that um, they are. Uh, I mean, I mean, the question of hunger is not only in Kabul in the capital, which is the capital. People are might be still around some people to help. But in the provinces of Afghanistan is really getting bad because for the longest time, uh, you know, the Muslim people, they have a way that neighbors will look after neighbors and the neighbors have something to share. But lately, the neighbors don't have anything. So therefore, they cannot even help the neighbors when it comes to some food or bread or whatever to share with them. So the, the situation is honestly is getting very bad. And, and, and we are hoping that it doesn't go to get any worse than what it is, because the, the uh, how shall I say, the, the result of a situation like this, you know, especially poverty, is extremely dangerous for a country like Afghanistan, because that opens the door for the, for the possibilities like people joining groups that are going to be, that are against, um, everybody and they want to blow themselves up, you know, like still the Daesh is doing that, or they're going to be selling their children like the way they are doing right now and, and, and selling them, or they're going to go, of course, and, 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 and try to steal and they're going to, so a lot of these things can happen uh, because of the, the poverty and hunger. So that is really uh, an area that if we could help, or if the world could really think of something not to let us get to that point, that will be, that will be marvelous because then maybe, maybe they, they will be safe. Maybe this, we won't have to be dealing with this. But uh, right now, uh, you know, things are, are going like the way things are going. And, um, and that is a, a reality of Afghanistan. Mabuba, the international community, I guess, is in this predicament. You know, they are trying to, to use leverage. They're trying to use money to hold the Taliban to account. We know that they've frozen $9 billion in central reserves. Uh, we know that that, that money that, that would normally be flowing through the economy is not. We know that people can only get $200 US out of the bank, if that, each week. Uh, we know that people haven't been paid for months, months and months. Uh, the international community trying to hold the Taliban to account for being a terror organization or being linked to a terror organization and also for its human rights record on, on women and girls. You were in an interview with the Taliban the other day on Tolo News yes. and they're pleading for international help and yet the answer is pretty simple, isn't it? The Taliban yeah. needs to modernise. What, what yeah. do they say when, when you tell them you need to change? You need to change for the world to, to open up and accept well, you. Well, know, yeah, the, the answer is not, is never a no. You know, the answer is always yes, of course. You know, why not? We will be doing this. And just give us some time. We are, we are really, we are really like very new. I mean, I mean, in that interview, I don't know because it was in Pashto and Parsi, uh, uh, the, the question that, you know, the way that the gentleman talked, you know, there, the, the, the Taleb, uh, he he was he was saying that you know how how um, respectful of the families of the women they are and how how they put the woman in such a high pedestal and they are really respecting them and they don't want to be you know uh, they don't want to talk to them badly or or negatively or whatever and and my answer was what are we supposed to do with all of these niceties are we supposed to eat it are we supposed to wear it as clothing are we supposed to live under it. I mean, I mean, it's like none of those things are going to help these mothers that don't have a job and they are the breadwinners of their families and they are the only ones that are bringing, you know, the food. So if they don't, they cannot go to work, if they cannot bring the food at the table for their children, if they cannot support them, then, then the world can be very nice and nice and nice to all of these women. But what difference does it make? They don't, they don't get what they need from it. So I told them, I said, you know, instead of for you guys, instead of going to the world and asking the world to be uh, kind to you and, and, and help you and, and, and let the money, you know, loose so you can spend it, 
why don't you start from when you're inside the country? Because the answer to all of this is really in Afghanistan. It's not outside of Afghanistan. If you if you let the girls go to school, uh, you know, for them, that's the main, the most important thing. So all of the girls can go from grade one to 12. If you do that, and if you let the woman to go and sit and go back to the offices and take a, you know, charge of their lives, then, then, then it's possible because what does that that does? It actually starts turning the smaller wheels of economy, you know, by by these people, these women bringing money, spending it on buying stuff that they need. So that that makes uh, that brings that makes life a bit more normal, and things are going to start opening up that way. But if you don't do that. Then, then, then the world can give you all the money. What is, what is the point? You know, it's not going to, it's not going to happen if something does not happen inside the country by the government that is ruling. The problem also, Mabuba, we know aid is not getting to Afghanistan. That money is not getting to the people. So, I mean, what is your message to the international community that is perhaps, you know, holding Afghanistan hostage in a way? The Taliban government. Uh, trying to hold them to to account, but really the people who are suffering are Afghanistan's most vulnerable. Absolutely, and that's the way that unfortunately it always happens. the The machinery that starts turning, you know, the um, uh, taking money away from these countries is kind of uh, easy without and without thinking that is not the government or is not somebody's or the people that they are running the country that we are punishing. Actually, the ones that we are punishing are the people of that country because by doing by by putting these these uh, restrictions on on uh, you know on anything which is food which is whatever you know import export or whatever the or, or the aid coming to the country is actually the people that are going to be uh, suffering. It's not, it's not really that much the government. But so that's why, and also the world actually pledged for a lot of you know, aid money to give the aid money now to Afghanistan. And, and I hope that those pledges become you know, real as well. And they will hold on you know, to the words that they promised and, and, and give, give the money to the, um, to, to the, to the Afghans so, so that the, or the organizations that they pledged it to so that they can, they can actually spend it in Afghanistan uh, on, the, on the people that they really so direly needed on the ground. Thanks, Mabiba. And, and, and look, I, I do want to, we'd like to leave time for, for people in the audience here in, in Asia sites and also online to ask a couple of questions. But, but before we do that, um, we've seen on the videos what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan now. People have seen it over the last, particularly over the last 20 years and beyond. Um, I'd also like to ask Dawood, um, now that you've left Afghanistan, um, you, some of your former colleagues, um, uh, I know when we spoke before, you didn't, you didn't want to leave. That was the last thing on your mind, but you had to. Um, now that you've left Afghanistan, you find yourself in, of all places, South Wales in the UK. Um, how does it feel? And, um, and sort of what are the next steps for you? Do you know? Right. So, um, as I said uh, before, so if this situation wouldn't come to the Afghanistan, I never would leave my, my country. So... Uh, in the place that uh, my children, my kids, my, my family, that which they don't have a, a future, uh, cannot stay over there. That's why I left the, I left the Afghanistan. I, I came to the UK. So now we came to the UK. So we settled in the in the UK. So um, first of all, I should say thank you, th thank you very much from the all British government and British army that helped us all. All to evacuated from Afghanistan and settled us in the in the in the good place in the country. So and they welcomed us uh, to their home and makes us feeling to here as a, our own home. So that's the first thing. The second one after this, so it looks like the 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 my my, my kid and my family has a good future in here because here is completely different world. world. Uh, so. Uh, and and also for the people who left in, behind in Afghanistan from the from the, our friends, so the they they don't they, they don't have a good situation right right now over there. Most most of them they are disappeared. They are 
they are separate away from the their families the, 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 their family is staying in the other place they, and they are staying in some other place because they are they are hiding they are afraid they 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 are been tracking by the Taliban because most of them they have been we actually all of us we've been involved in the very high profile operation military operation in Afghanistan so that, that that's why they cannot they cannot stay there and they cannot actually the Taliban they are not going to leave them in in that country uh, they they should they should uh, uh, come out as soon as it possible. Otherwise, so it might be gonna late for them. Thanks, Dawood. Um, look, I, I, when we when we first talked about doing this event, um, a couple of things really resonated when Anna and I were talking, and and we met Mabuba and Dawood, and it is this concept of of um, there being some persistent hope. And I remember feeling that very sensitively when, when I was there and Anna and I have spoken about it in the past. Um, and I think, um, you know, we've heard from inside Afghanistan and, and Dawood's family back in the UK and that, that we hope that that, that sort of pers- that does persist and, and continue forward. Um, I think. Can, can I ask Mabuba? Mabuba, do you have hope? Do, do I have, have hope? hope? Yeah. Do you have hope for your country? I do. Definitely. Because if I didn't have any hope, I wouldn't be go- I wouldn't be able to go on a day. So I really have to uh, the hope that I have. It's in my heart and it's in what I do and the kind of the work that I do. And I want to keep on at it because you know because this is not the end of life for us. Afghanistan, as long as it's Afghanistan, I want to be there. The people are going to be there and they're going to make something out of this country. We have to. We cannot disappear from the earth. You know, we haven't so far with our the history that we have behind us. You know, we really had a very, very, very tough history. We've that the world always wanted to get us and and kind of destroy us, but we've we've stood our ground. You know, so far. So I think we are going to be doing that again. And I really, really want to do that. But one thing I want to tell you: we cannot do that without the help of people like you, like Elliot. Like the people that are really caring, you know, all over the world. I, it might not be the governments that I'm counting on, but by God, I'm counting on the people of the world. The people of the world are entirely different. They they look at the whole situation very differently. So as long as we have them, as long as you raise our voices, we're going to be okay. And I'm not going to give up hope. No way. No way. Isn't she amazing? She is absolutely amazing. Well, we should probably turn it over to to you guys to ask these two amazing people some questions. Who would like to start? Be brave. Yes. Yes, sir. Very simple question. How can we help sitting here in this audience? Because I think this is the feeling in the room, you know, how on earth can we help? Mabuba, how, how can these wonderful people help you? I mean, you wonderful people have always helped people that they've been in, you know, in, in need of help. The world, uh, Afghanistan, what is happening in Afghanistan today right now is not the only thing and is not the last nor the first. And you have done it before. One of the first things we always need, and this because I'm asking the people to do that, is really to help us monetarily. If you can, you know, so it can make life a bit easier for us because we are going to go through some kind of a hardship and I cannot tell you how that's going to be. There's quite a lot of us, there's quite a lot of the people like that in Afghanistan. And I don't even know how we are going to be really working on distribution of the help, on distribution of food, on distribution of clothing and everything. So so what we need really at this point, it is the monetary help. And if we could get that, then maybe we can ease the pain and the suffering of these people a little bit. And, and, and for now, and that is our, 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 how shall I say, the first step 
trying to answer to this problem. And then we should have plants as a, as a medium a way and then a, you know, a long way. And, and that is something that we really have to work on. And still we will need the help of the people of the world you know, to do that by maybe giving us experts, by giving us a monetary help, by giving us, you know, helping us with education, by sending our kids to some colleges and things, giving them some scholarships, you know, things like that. So, but right now the monetary help will be something that we will be really, we can use a lot. And I thank you for that. So we have set up uh, on behalf of, of Mabuba a, a crowdfunder site called Mabuba's Girls. Uh, and the QR code will be available uh, to all of you um, when you leave. And I, I know that any, any donation would be, be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, there's also uh, another... Uh, crowdfunding campaign that's been set up by former British paratroopers, um, obviously for the relocation, resettlement of, of Afghans to, to places like the UK. So once again, those details will be available. Uh, and if you, if you could donate, we would be truly, truly grateful. Next question. Hello. Um, as long as I lost there, was there's uh, still some uh, special forces fighting in Panchisha Valley, but do you think that they can still keep on their stronghold and fight back, or at least bring the get better province? Dawood, do you, do you okay. know if any more special forces troops are still operating in Afghanistan? There was a resistance, a whole, you know, in, in Panjshir Valley, but my understanding was they're no longer there. Yeah, yeah the, there are still some people, they are fighting, uh, they are still fighting against the Taliban. So, and uh, most of them, most of them, they are uh, uh, Afghan um, uh, ex special forces and Afghan commandos. They are, they are still fighting. They are, uh, they are at the moment, they are in the very, very bad situation in the highest mountain location of Afghanistan. So they are, um, they, but they are still fighting. They, they 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 just keep fighting there because the even if 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 they if they if they come in, coming in so as I said before the Taliban they are not gonna live, let them to live and those guys they choose to fight rather than to give up to come live with the with the with the this uh, with the Taliban because they they were been fighting for many years against them and. Uh, uh, if if uh, how they how they can live beside uh, beside with them uh, right now, so that's why they choose that they they, they cho choose to fight. I think I think one thing that that people don't necessarily know is that um, in Afghanistan, a lot of the the soldiers that fought for the Afghan National Security Forces against various insurgent groups, they are known throughout their community. They, they, they live there, they go back to their homes, they go back to their families, and the community know that that's what they've been doing for the past 15 years. Um, so they have been the target of reprisals over the last three to four months. And I think Dawood um, put it very uh, poignantly, they, they have no choice. Um, that's two questions. One, for the education of the girls that are with you now, um, do you have computers? And if we could organize for teachers online, even maybe one hour a day or a few hours a week, would that be of use to the girls? And the second question is, are goods getting to you? So if we were to send clothing or things that are non-perishable, are they getting to you? Is that possible? And is it of help? Thank you, Vida John, for the, for the offer. And the answer to both of your questions is yes. The answer to your first question, uh, which is, you know, really helping the girls with uh, teaching them, you know, computers and maybe providing them with some computers because we do have some computers even right now, but we don't have a teacher for them that, you know, can do that and, and online, it will be perfect, especially if it is in Farsi, that would be really, really wonderful. And also regarding the, the clothing, 
I have not received any goods yet, but it was uh, once upon a time, I know that the things were getting to Afghanistan. And, and, if you, and if you send it and if we get in touch with each other and you can you know, send it to me and then I will you know, tell you where and, and how to send it. And then most probably I can get it and be able to distribute it amongst not only my girls, but you know, a lot of other girls in, Cal in Afghanistan who really need it. So that is something that it can be arranged um, it, and it will, it will get to us, hopefully. I know it's going to take a while, but it will. I must say, I mean, you know, we talk about what has been achieved in Afghanistan in the last 20 years and the education of, of girls has been extraordinary. The, the number of girls who've gone through school, high school and at university. I mean, Dawood and I were in a safe house where, you know, one of, one of the, the cooks, she was a university student, you know, and, and I've kept in touch with her and, and she still can't study. All these girls, they want to study, they want to learn, you know, and, and even, even the little girl in my piece, you know, she wants to be a teacher. They, 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 they have a glimpse of what it is like out there, you know, and they want to be a part of it. They don't want to be stuck, you know, in this mindset that, that they're a commodity that can be sold, you know, and education is the only way to, to you know, break that cycle. Absolutely. So, yes, please, please. Yes. Hi. Um, if we raise money and how safe um, that we make sure the money can reach you and um, how safe is the situation for you there and that Taliban will not sabotage or steal the money that we, um, we raise and send to you? Oh, well, you know, so far the Taliban, as far as, you know, the money that gets to people via uh, charities, they haven't really touched that. And, and they don't have that kind of a record in the back, you know, before either. So I am hoping that, uh, you know, that, that if it gets to, 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 to my account or somehow to me, then I will be able to, although it's very hard to get it out of the banks at this point, because they're really giving it to us as a, as a small drops, but that's, you know, uh, so we could, we could get our hands on it and, and make it work. So, so far, so far, it hasn't been any problem with the, with the charitable money that has been sent to different organizations. So that's why, uh, you know, uh, anything is possible in this world, you know, the way I see it, but so far it hasn't been. So maybe, maybe it will be safe. I think it will be. Hello, I'm from Azerbaijan. So naturally I feel very related to you uh, all sitting in the panel there and on the screen. So I just wanted to say, that as a mother of three boys, and Anna is also a mother of two boys, we talk a lot about the destiny of the girls, I understand. What's happening with little boys there? What's happening with young boys? I know before even we were hearing awful stories, the boys caught during the war. That's first question. And second, as an older person, do you think that gives you sort of, in our society, it's like that, right? Even Taliban or anybody else, right? That gives you a little bit more protection that you can talk to them as an equal and they won't hurt you and respect your word, please give us that hope. I definitely, first to your second question, yes, uh, absolutely. My white hair and the fact that I'm 73 years old and I keep on mentioning it anytime I see them or anytime I'm sitting next to them, I always mention that so that they will always remember who they are sitting with, with their grandmother. And they are, you know, they are respectful, there is no doubt. And, and, um, and that is that is really working for my my benefit in a way in at the in, in the end result as a benefit for all of the girls and the people that I'm working with. And regarding the, your your um, second, this was your second question, but the first question regarding the little boys, you know, I want to tell you that that this is it is so hard on them. It is so hard on them on the little boys as well, because you know, and on the men of this country also. Because don't forget, you know, most of these men, they're losing so much of their face 
and, and their, with their families because they cannot be the breadwinners of their families anymore. They are not capable of actually providing for their families. So that is that is such a such a sad thing to them because because it, it's like it's like it's t- something has been taken away from their manhood. You know that they cannot do that. They cannot provide anymore. So that psychologically is making them extremely vulnerable. And that's why you can see more men that they actually hang themselves or more more men that they want to, you know, that they're doing things that kind of destroy literally the lives of them, themselves and their children because they cannot take it anymore. That whole that whole feeling of shame and the fact that they cannot provide for their families is killing them. It's killing the men of this country, it's killing the boys of this country, and it's killing the girls of this country. I really, really mean it. It's like bad. Psychologically, we are really in a very bad place. Uh, Mabuba Dawi, thank you very much. Um, I think we can probably be cheeky and uh, and, uh, ask for one more question if it's quick. Has anyone got a quick last question? Hi. Um, so um, thank you for your story. It's truly inspiring. Um, I have seen on the news that the Taliban leaders have met with uh, the Chinese leaders. And now with UK and US presence gone, uh, what kind of role do you think China can play in the future of Afghanistan? Um, yeah, so that's my question. I'm not sure if that's a, a, a quick one, but we'll try. <laughs> I can answer this question. Somewhat, I don't know, because, you know, this is very much the politics of China. Um, I have a feeling that the Chinese are doing what the Chinese always do, which is for them, the most important thing is really to to get a hold of whatever the minerals and whatever we have underneath Afghanistan, take that out, use it and make things out of it and make money. And that's how that's how they look at the whole thing. For Chinese, it's not going to be, you know, like their interest in Afghanistan or anywhere in the world is very different from the interest of the rest of the world in the world, um, because they are um, they are kind of a set on on like the way you know they went about in in, in Africa and the way they went about in, in in South America, and now they're going to be doing the same thing, you know, in anywhere in Asia and especially in Afghanistan, being the country like right next door. So, but they are our neighbors. And, and the one thing that we really have to do as far as, you know, us, the Afghans are concerned, we have to live with our neighbors. There is nothing we can do about that. It's not, and neighbors are somebody that you cannot, it's like the family, you know, friends you can choose, but the family you're born into. So your neighbors are exactly the same thing. Neighbors are the ones that you are, you're right next to them. So for whatever, if they are not nice or if they are not kind, like we never had, you were never very lucky as far as neighbors were concerned. We always had nastiest neighbors around and, and we still do. So those neighbors, we have to we have to live with them because there is there is nothing we can do. And we have to uh, come up with some kind of a, an agreement, some kind of a, um, you know, something that will will satisfy all of us in one way or another. And we can live together. That's all we have to do. And that's, of course, my my look at the whole thing. Thank you, Mabuba. I think, um, you know, one thing that I would say is that over the last six months in particular, but over the last 100 years um, and, and beyond, Afghanistan finds itself at the center of politics all the time. Um, and actually, when we were talking about this and what we've witnessed, uh, witnessed particularly over the last three months, is that we wanted to focus on what, the, what was happening to the people on the ground. Um, and I think actually where Afghanistan finds itself, regardless of which other nation is involved, and, and, and quite frankly, many, many and most have, um, uh, where Afghanistan finds itself now is in a place where it really needs um, us to listen to the people. Um, and, um, and so thank you, Mabuba, uh, and thank you, for dude for, for letting, you ask, letting us ask you those questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for, for coming and your, for, your, for your questions and for your interests and, uh, and truly for, for caring about a story that obviously is not in the headlines the way that perhaps it was in August and September, but the, the need is, is just as real, if not more so. So thank you again for, for your time this evening and for caring. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you very much.
On behalf of Asia Society Hong Kong, I want to thank Anna, uh, Elliot, uh, Daewoo, and Mahupa. It's been, uh, what a great, it, it's really heart-wrenching. I remember I was in uh, Virginia. I was in visiting with my family in Virginia this uh, August when the refugees started arriving in Dulles and they set up the community center nearby. And we were able in our little way, you know, uh, 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 collecting clothes and, and donation to the refugees arriving. And the person who organized that for our family was my brother who was in Afghanistan about 20 years ago as a contractor. And he loved Afghanistan like you, Anna. And, uh, and he brought back great stories and great memories. Um, he has an eight-year-old daughter now. And as, as I watch your piece, I'm, I, I'm in tears. And it's, it's unfortunate. It's something that's happening in this world right now. And um, I feel helpless, but I'm also inspired by what Mahupa <laughs> has said uh, tonight. And also Anna, Elliot, and your stories. Um, I think it's two stories that we um, we make a difference, and we I'm so happy, uh, so proud that Asia Society Hong Kong can partner with Harshika. Thank you. Um, uh, that conversation that started in my quarantine hotel a few weeks ago has resulted in this program and this partnership with JP Morgan, and I'm very grateful for the the collaboration. I look forward to more collaborations like this and more stories. I think in Hong Kong, we're very, very fortunate in Hong Kong to be able to sit in this room and uh, and hear these stories. And uh, and there's stuff we can do about it, something we can do about it. So I hope uh, tonight's program inspire you to go out and make a difference. And I want to, again, thank you, our wonderful speakers tonight and for, uh, for bringing us these really um, wonderful stories that will kind of, um, it kind of reminds us of our humanities and we need to help each other. And uh, it's whether in, during this time of COVID or, um, you know, um, I, I feel helpless uh, when I hear things like this, but I am going to go and work on that QR code. And that's something I'm gonna share that at QR code uh, on my social media with my friends and family. Um, I think every little bit helps. So again, thank you all for joining us this evening and look forward to welcoming you back at Asia Society so where we will continue to tell stories. Thank you.